host of Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and you're listening to the Cannon Fire Podcast. Cannon Fire Podcast, brother! You ain't listening, and you're missing out. Woo! Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to a brand new edition of the Cannon Fire Podcast. Today, we're going to be going over everything you need to know about the Buccaneers' upcoming matchup against the Arizona Cardinals in Raymond James Stadium for what feels like the first time since 1979. So if you're new around here, I am your host, Rhett Matthew. Joined alongside me, as always, my good buddy and co-host, Mr. Bucks Football, Evan Wanish. Evan, how are you doing today, man? Doing pretty good. How are you? I'm doing good. So uh, as you can see, we are here together in person for the first time in what seems like, I think, a little over a year. Yep, two years, I think. Because it was training camp a few years ago when yeah. you came down that we actually had gotten together and recorded in the same room. So here we are, CFP in person, and of course, we'll both be at the game on Sunday. It's going to be a great time, but let's preview this game. Actually, first of all, how has your time in Florida been? What do you think so far? Does it suck as much as it did last time? No, that's good. It's always good to, good to get away. So yeah. um, for the people that don't know, um, you know I probably don't live in Florida, but I actually live in Pennsylvania. So uh, right now I think we're actually getting a little bit of flurries at home. So uh, it's nice to be nice to be here where right now it's not the sunniest day out, but still a whole lot better than, uh, than being there right now. So. Oh, yeah, definitely a whole lot better. Didn't mean that personally. <laughs> so let's take a look at this game. The 2-6 and six Tampa Bay Buccaneers will return to Raymond James, and they will take on the 3-5-1 and one Arizona Cardinals this Sunday. The last home game that the Bucks played, if you can believe it or not, was that terrible Giants game where Matt Gay blew the game-winning field goal. Um, it's been a long time since I've been mad about that. And, I mean, that's the yeah. last time the Bucks were at home. So, really just kind of take that for what it is and uh, help it put things in perspective. But they've been gone a long time. Mm-hmm. Since that game, the Bucks have traveled 20,400 air miles to play four games. One of them was in London, counted as a home game, but it definitely was not a home game. And then after that, you play the Rams, starts with a great win, and then you lose four in a row. So there isn't anything super promising about this season as you come back into Tampa. It's not like we're talking about playoff hopes. It's not like we're talking about sneaking in on a wild card because if they really want to be in the playoff chase, they've got to put together a tear here at home. And yeah, the schedule favors them. The last five out of eight are at home. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, man. Obviously, you're looking for improvement and there are things that need to be repaired um, but I think it all starts with this Sunday if they're going to do anything at all. And they've got a tough task ahead of them. Because Arizona, while the record is 3-5-1, and one, they've got some key parts to that team that will really slow us down, I think. Yeah, I mean, just like you said, if you want to have, I mean, even a 500 season, you know, like 8-8. Eight and eight, If you want to achieve 8-8, eight and eight, you, you have to win this game. Um, yeah. The Cardinals team is not that great now. I know the Bucks aren't that great, so it's it's tougher. You know, it's not like we're talking about the Patriots versus Cardinals here. I think looking at the Bucks, though, like the argument can be made that they're much better than their record shows. I'm not saying they're so, they should be six and two right now, but they've lost some games that are so close that you almost feel like they should be around four and four, maybe five and three on a good day, just because of the way these games have turned out. You know, luck hasn't been in our favor. Yeah, well, they should definitely have. Three wins, right? If Matt right. A makes that field goal um, versus the Giants, they have three wins no matter what. So. And then, I mean, you look at the Titans game, mm-hmm. the uh, the early whistle that could have changed the tone of how that game wrapped up. Yeah, there was still, I think, about five minutes left in the fourth quarter. But I don't know, man. If the Buccaneers score that and they hold on, that's another win you're talking about, bringing them to 4-4. Four and four. So there's just so many of those close contests that they've had. But I think they can pull it together and – Make something happen. What are you looking at for this Sunday? Yeah, well, one more point I want to make of that. Like you said, like the close games. I mean, they're a Vernon Hargraves missed tackle away from being 1-7 and seven right now. So, right, it, right. You know, it's both sides. But um, talking about this Sunday, you know, I'm looking for, for this offense to continue to, to be good. Uh, I thought it was decent Tennessee after um, a rough showing versus Carolina. You know, they scored a couple of garbage time points there uh, yeah. in London. Uh, but Tennessee, they played well, I thought. Uh, not well enough, but... And then uh, Seattle, I thought they played even better. So, 
Um, Seattle, I thought overall that was one of their best offensive performances. Yeah, I think the offensive game plan they came out with against Seattle looked really good, especially based off of that first drive. You know, we talked last week about how good Ronald Jones looked in his capacity stepping up as a starter um, and just the way they found balance to things. And let's talk about the offense first since you brought it up. Um, I have on my notes that I think this game could be a shootout. Both the Bucks and the Cardinals, they're among the bottom five teams in scoring defense in the league this season. Um, Arizona's defense has got some really, really talented edge rushers, though. They've got Chandler Jones, Terrell Suggs, um, and their secondary has improved because, of course, they've got Patrick Peterson, a guy that Buccaneers fans know too well. So they've got some pieces, but... I think with the way this offense was rolling, especially how they looked against Seattle, I think they'll do better against Arizona. And then Arizona's got some pieces as well with rookie Kyler Murray. We'll talk about him in a second. But I think it could be a high-scoring game. What do you think? Yeah, I I think so. Uh, Arizona's defense ranks last in a lot of categories. Not dead last, but, you know, in the bottom five, uh, as does the Bucks, Bucks defense. Uh, but I will agree with what you said. I mean, it's not like they have nobody on their defense. I right. Mean, I think Chandler Jones is one of the most underrated players in the NFL. Oh, yeah. Um, and he's just not talked about a lot because, you know, he's in Arizona. Like, I mean. We're, you, we're used to that. Only, yeah, <laughs> the only person that's really talked about on that defense is Patrick Peterson. Yeah. And they were without him for the first, I believe, six or eight games, something like that, uh, to start the year. So now yeah. he's back. Right. And, you know, they're hoping that's that's a boost to their, uh, their defense. But, you know, they also have uh, Buda Baker and um, Jordan Hicks, a linebacker, came over from Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah, uh, they do. He's been really good for them. So I'm not 100% sure where their problems stem from because if you look at each unit, they really have some solid players. Yeah. Uh, as do the Bucks, But um, I do agree that I think this could be a pretty high-scoring game. Now, you brought up a big key to that Arizona defense. It was Patrick Peterson. Uh, we got a heavyweight matchup taking place on Sunday, and it's between Mike Evans and Patrick Peterson. Um, Evans has been on a record-setting pace these past few games. Like He has been playing like a man possessed pretty much ever since he had that slouch in the beginning of the season. Uh, he got called out in a sense, and ever since then, he's really stepped it up. But if he can't do it this week... If Patrick Peterson is too much for him and he puts the clamps on, let's hope that he doesn't because, you know, we know Mike Evans, he's a big physical guy. He's going to win, but how often he faces the double team plus Patrick Peterson, you never really know. So if in a situation where, you know, Mike Evans can't get it done, of course you have Chris Godwin. Chris Godwin can torch their secondary, but it also kind of leaves you in a spot that we brought up last week as well, the lack of a third wide receiver on this team. Mm -hmm. And... Rashad Perryman is still a Buccaneer. He'll probably still be a Buccaneer by the time they play Arizona on Sunday. But hey, he caught a touchdown. Yeah, he did. Caught a, He didn't exactly mean to catch a touchdown, no, but he hey, caught a touchdown. He yeah, he's one of those guys that sticks around week after week, and nobody can stand it. But he just finds a way to stay on that roster, and it is what it is. The Buccaneers probably aren't going to let him go before Sunday, so you got to forego that compensatory pick. But it is what it is. We'll see what he can do, but. The reason I brought up wide receiver three and the lack of it is because there is a big piece to that Bucks offense coming back this Sunday. Mm -hmm. Guy who was dealing with a hamstring injury, missed some action. OJ Howard is back, and I really hope they use him the way that we've wanted them to all season. Well, if they don't in this game, I don't know if they're going to. Arizona's defense has not been good at all, but they've almost been dead. I believe they might be dead last in tight ends. Like, they have allowed tight ends to just run all over them all season long, no right. matter who it is. Um, I mean, it's it's remarkable how bad they are against tight ends. I remember there's a few years, you know, where the Bucks were kind of, eh, like, not so great against tight ends. Right. Like the Jimmy Grahams, the Greg Olsons, they'd always yeah. torture them. Um, this Cardinals team, their biggest weakness is covering a tight end. Yeah. Uh, they just cannot seem to figure it out. And it's a great spot for O.J. Howard to come back because – you know, Cameron Brate's great, but we all know that Howard brings a different element to the game that Brate does. It's kind of like Pete and Barber and Ronald Jones. You know? Yeah. Barber's good, but Ronald Jones just brings something different to the table that yeah. Barber can't. So. And that's the thing with O.J. Howard is you got to look at how he's going to be used. You have to imagine these coaches have watched enough film to realize, like you said, Arizona has that trouble protecting against the tight ends. Um, 
But the beginning of the season, before he got injured, we saw him really pick up a role as a blocker. And that's what has ultimately held him back from getting those targets we wish he would. But I bring up his role as a blocker because we also have a full offensive line. And we saw that having all of those guys starting, DeMar Dotson and Alex Kappa included, it really puts them all on the same page. And they looked fairly good against Seattle. So if they can hold their own then I think O.J. Howard really has a lot of room to uh, to be used as the athletic pass-catching tight end that we truly know he is. Yeah, I think they want to trust Howard uh, a little bit more. Uh, so you said in Seattle, you know, I believe the offensive line didn't allow a sack in the first half. Right, it's yeah. The first time it's happened all year. But, I mean, Jameis Winston's still on pace for a record number of sacks for him. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, O.J., hopefully – um, he'll be able to to get more receiving targets. I think it really all depends on how the Cardinals' edge rush is looking. I think if the Cardinals are really blitzing and they're getting home and getting to Winston, I think the Bucks won't really have much of a choice but to kind of put Howard back in that blocking role and, and thus, you know, disappointing fantasy owners. But right. um, ultimately, I mean, that's the best because if your offensive line needs help, the first person you're going to do is a tight end. Yeah. Right? Running back is the second person. So it goes offensive line, then tight end, then running back. So they don't want to say, oh, we'll send out OJ, but have Peyton Barber sit, Peyton Barber sit back to, to block. They don't want right. that. So right. if the well, Bucks knowing are, them, they'll just throw Dare Ogunbowale back there because they well, love using him as a blocker. He's, well, he's supposed to be better as a blocker. I don't know. Okay, this guy, in the preseason, he looked good. Give yeah, him I liked there, him. I was a big right? fan of him last year and in the preseason this year. I'll admit to that. Yeah, but um, he struggled so far. But, yeah, like I said, to me, based on how this Bucks season has gone with Howard, I think it all depends on what type of Arizona pass rush the Bucks see on Sunday. Yeah. So you really want to hope that they balance things out with that offensive game plan. We brought up O.J. Howard. We brought up Mike Evans and Pat Pete with the air attack, but we haven't talked about the ground, and I really want to go over that before we kind of get in depth on this Kyler Murray kid. Um, Ronald Jones, you brought up his name. Second-year running back, got his first career start last Sunday in Seattle. Um, He snapped a run of 26 straight starts by Peyton Barber. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I, I didn't saw, realize Barber started that long. Yeah, I, I read that, and I was like, wow, it doesn't seem like it has been 26 games. But, yeah, Ronald Jones snapped that streak, so good for him in a sense. Now, Barber does remain an important part of the offense, mm. but Ronald Jones, like you said, has showed off that he's just the more explosive runner. He can do uh, a little bit more, and we saw it plenty of times against Seattle um, he had three runs with 10 or more yards, and a, a few of those looked like they could have braked for much, much more. Um, given, how well, uh, given how well he played in Seattle, he finished with around like 80 yards from scrimmage, I believe, and a touchdown. You got to believe he's going to start. And I almost want to believe he's going to get more carries. I said last week headed into the game, 20 carries for Rojo will make me happy. He finished with, I think, 18 or 19. Um... I feel like they're really only going to groom him into a more uh, into a more fed running back, I guess, if that makes sense. Like, I can only expect his carries to go up. You know what I mean? You know yeah. what I'm trying to say? Yeah. But wow. I, I think it's a I think it'll be an interesting day for him because he's going to dictate what that offense does uh, in keeping it balanced. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, one way to limit, you know, we talk about OG Howard and pass block, and one way way to limit, you know, any pass pass rush is going to be be able to run the football. Yeah. Right. So. Um, you know, if you're just sitting back throwing it 50 times, the pass rush is just going to be able to tee off, and that's not good for anybody. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you said, you know, he's sort of getting, like, you know, the start, and it's late in the season. I, I want to bring up that it's comparable to, to Bruce Arians, and it's this is uh, valid because of the opponents this week. It's comparable yeah. to what Bruce Arians did with David Johnson in Arizona, his rookie season. Uh, David Johnson, I believe, scored like four touchdowns in the first two games, like one on special teams and like three is like big plays. Yeah. And Bruce Arians didn't name him the starter until like week ten. So that's what he likes to do. This is how he likes to groom his running backs. And I think Rojo right now, I'm not saying he's the type of talent that David Johnson is, um, because I think David Johnson is still very good, but. 
hopefully he's on that sort of trajectory in his career. Right. And you almost look at the path that he's taken. Like you said, it is late in the season. Well, second half of the season. Uh, and he's finally getting a start after kind of showing us that he can start. Flashes. He, flash. Right. Like, people have been saying, let's start him. I've been saying it as well. But he truly earned the spot that he's in. Now, the reason I think Sunday can be a breakout game for him is going back to what Arizona's defense puts on the field. Uh, they're allowing 126.9 yards per game on the ground this mm. year and an average of around five yards per carry. Mm. Um, Bruce Arians has stressed that they want the balanced attack, and if you can get the run game going, that opens up a little bit more for teams to bite on play action, for yeah. example, set up a long pass if you really want to do that. Um, we know we're not a fan of those long developing plays, but if you can get a team to bite, then of course it's going to work in your favor. But I think Ronald Jones is a, uh, a good game, and I'm excited to see what he can put on the field because um, I think he's only going to get better, dude. Yeah, I mean, right now in certain situations, obviously Barber can't be your, your – Barber, Ronald Jones can't be your number one – option like on a goal line this is what Barbara was bringing up right like on the goal line situation right I would probably trust Peyton, Peyton Barber a little bit more than Ronald Jones right now um, you know but you said about the play action you know who's really good off play action Jameis Winston yeah like that's like if, if you look at his stats they're better off play action it's been that way his entire career and you know unfortunately if you don't have a run game nobody's biting on play action so um it's like you said. It's very important, and especially this Arizona defense. I didn't even know they were that bad against the run, <laughs> um, but it's important now for the Buccaneers. Just just run the ball. You know, yeah. if at first you get one two yards on the drive, whatever. Like go back to it. Like when you do that, you got to keep hitting the holes. Like you, you, you can't. Just because something didn't work on one drive doesn't mean it won't work on the other. If right. the Cardinals are that bad at stopping the run, you keep running the ball. You know, eventually you're going to break one. Yeah. Well, obviously, if you're yeah. getting stopped for negative yards and setting up third and longs, then you got to sort of get away from it. But just keep at it, right? Yeah. Know, know you're the defense's strengths and weaknesses. And right now, that sounds like a huge weakness. Absolutely. Now, you brought up Jameis Winston. Let's talk about him, and then we'll kind of jump into what Arizona brings on offense. Will he be a buck <laughs> next year? Yeah, he will. <laughs> uh, the yeah, the million-dollar question, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, let's talk about Jameis Winston. So an interesting game for him. Kind of the same storyline that is brought up at least once a month. Can he consistently play good football? And you look at his performance against Seattle. He played a hell of a game. Probably yeah. one of his best games on the season. Can he turn around and do it again in Tampa? I want to hope yes. I really do. Because as much as we talk about hypotheticals with this guy, I want him to do well. I've said that so many times on the show. I want him to do well. I want him to perform and give us a product that makes me feel comfortable about him as quarterback. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that I've looked at this week, and I've seen it tossed around quite a bit, is the slope of interceptions thrown by Bruce Arians' quarterbacks over the first three quarters of any season. Um, he's going to throw interceptions, but it, I, I think right now, with the way things line up and the way things favor the Bucks on their schedule, I think if any time is a good time to put together a stretch of decent games, it's now. Yeah. And, um, like, he's not I, – I don't know. Like, it feels like a bad Jameis season. But when you look at things in the grand scale, like, you look at his season totals, I just feel like we haven't seen the worst from him. And yeah, I don't not, think – I, I don't think we will. No. I mean, to me, there's two outliers here. The Rams game. Yeah. And then a London game. Yeah. Those are two where one is, I believe he threw four touchdowns in that Rams game. So that's going to put his touchdown totals up. Yeah. But, and then he threw five interceptions in a London game. So that's going to put his interception numbers up. So basically, um, you know, it, it seems like a bad Winston season because I think a lot of people are thinking just about that London game and right. week, and week one. Like, I think a lot of people, because after week one, you know, there was a lot of, oh, he's out, right? He's right, gone. yeah. But then he played decent week two, week three, week four, kind of went away. Week five, he played okay, but it still, it wasn't there. Like, the, the, oh, he's right. done, right? It wasn't yeah. there. Week six, London, it came back. 
week seven by week eight. He played. I thought he played okay, right? Yeah. I, I don't think he didn't have his best game, but I mean, I thought you know he gave him a chance to win, um, and I, I thought he was decent. Yeah. Uh, and then tennis, uh, Tennessee, Seattle. I thought was probably like his best game. I don't know the Rams game. I think he threw it over fifty times. Right, the Rams um, game can kind of get blown out of proportion because yeah. it was it was definitely an air heavy game. Yeah, I mean, and th- this game might go to that. You yeah, know? because like you said, with high scoring. So, um, maybe like I said, that Rams game he threw the ball fifty times. There were more explosive plays. Right, but I think the better overall game from Jameis Winston was last week. So. History, if, if we're just going off of this season, he should be in for a good day against the Cardinals. Right. Should be. But, like you said, you know, every Sunday, you don't know what you're getting with this guy. Yeah. Like, you, you just don't. And you hope. And, yeah, you're going to get probably a touchdown or two, but you're hoping it's not the, the three interception, four interception. You're hoping that turns into a three touchdown, four touchdown day. Right. And I'm not a superstitious guy. I'm only superstitious when it comes to sports. And I'm actually <laughs> have this inner conflict with myself about what I'm going to wear to the game on Sunday. Um, if you've been following the show for a while, you've probably heard me mention my buck beads more than a few times. I'm very superstitious with those because when I wore them, we sucked ass. So I don't wear them anymore. Do I wear my Jameis Winston color rush jersey to the game on Sunday? What or do your, I wear something else? What is your record with the James Winston color rush jersey on? Um, the like, last time have you wore it this year at all? The last time I wore it was against New Orleans. Oh no. Yeah. Um. Like I wear it during the week. Yeah. I wear it to work. I wear it, you know, out doing stuff. But I haven't worn it on game day. And the only reason I bring it up is because this is the first game that I'm going to go to this year. Mm-hmm. You want to win this one? So I want to. I want to win, win this one, and yeah. like I want. Actually, win the first uh, home game. Yeah, first home game of the year. Actually, they well, won we're. I mean, so. yeah, zero and three in home games. You count the London game, and then yep. of course you count the ugly Mac A missed kick. But you want to win your first home game. I want to look good, and I, I feel good when I wear my Jameis Winston jersey. But if I wear the Winston jersey, and then he goes out there and throws four interceptions, yeah, then I'm just gonna leave it at the stadium. Like I'm just. You're just gonna leave it. Yeah, there. Just, like I can't yeah. take that home. I'll, yeah. I'll leave it on the pirate ship or something, man. <laughs> like something's gonna have to give, and uh, I don't know. I, I haven't made that decision yet, but I think I'll end up wearing the jersey, maybe. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like I'm not. What jersey are you wearing? I'm actually just wearing a Bucks polo. It's oh. a comfortable, dry fit, you know. Yeah. Bucks polo, no, just yeah, like the one I got yeah, on right like now. That one, yeah. It's like a like a pewter one, you know. Okay. So, nice. Um. Yeah. I. I you know. So since I'm from PA. I think this weather is like kind of hot. So um, <laughs> when I was sitting in the stands, I used to wear a jersey, right? I, I used to I used to wear a jersey, and when I'm sitting in the stands, I was really hot. Like I yeah. was like, man, like it is roasting right now. <laughs> and so I was like, you know, what? like last year I decided I was like, let me just try the polo out, and just see how it works. Last year was the first time I did the polo. Yeah, and I was comfortable. So um, yeah, I just wear wear the polo, and uh, I mean they lost last year when I went. Didn't score a touchdown last year. Oh year. man, um, that was yeah. the uh, the sixteen to three Redskins game. Ah, <sighs> jeez. Uh, so, but you know, anyways, I pretty confident they're gonna score a touchdown at least on Sunday. So I think so. Yeah. You look at the weather report coming into it. I believe I saw something around the realm of seventy one degrees at kickoff. Because I think we have our first cold front of the year moving oh, in this man, weekend. Seventy degrees. Paulie D. Oh, Paul. So cold. Paul Delegato. Right. Yeah. I know you're <laughs> going to be freezing. Uh, Paul Delegato. Paulie D. He basically reported that temperatures this weekend could get as low as they have been since January. So it'll be an interesting one. But I really hope it cools off because I'm going to be sitting down there by the ship and. I know my pale complexion is not going to help me out against the Florida sun, but... Oh, trust me. Even though I'm from PA, yeah, that's not going to (laughs) work. So we've gone over the Buccaneers' offense. We've gone over the weather for this Sunday's game. Let's go over the opponents. And uh, first and foremost, you got to look at Kyler Murray. I joked around on Twitter, and I called him a -a make-a-wish kid because anytime you see him run out of the tunnel behind his teammates, it's hilarious, dude. I have to laugh. Like, it's unprofessional, sure, but it's so (laughs) damn funny. Um... But they're going to need to contain Kyler Murray. He's a rookie yeah. quarterback. Um, he's a true dual threat. And, I mean, he was the first player drafted in the draft. And right now he's playing like it. He's a pretty accurate passer. He's already thrown for 2,229 yards. 
and he's rushed for 313 yards. Um, he's dangerous when he breaks out of the pocket. Yep. When I look at Kyler Murray, I see a smaller, little bit less accurate, and hell of a lot less experienced Russell Wilson. Now, okay. Wilson only ran the ball one time against Tampa Bay on Sunday, and that was the drive where it set them up for the missed game-winning field goal. He only ran one time, and you have to assume that the defensive game plan is going to be very similar when you're dealing with a dual-threat quarterback, a guy who has the wheels, who can get away from you. But I brought up Russell Wilson only running one time is because the difference between Russell Wilson and Kyler Murray is that Murray is a rookie, and Russell Wilson has been doing this for close to 10 years. He doesn't want to scramble that much and get hit. hit. Exactly. I think Kyler Murray is going to be a little more loose with uh, when he breaks off for a big run. He's a rookie. He's kind of going through that development where he's going to find out what he can and can't do. So you have to expect him a little bit more. But, I mean, Kyler Murray... He's a part of an offense that, when it gets going, it can be clicking. Because not only do they have Murray, they've got David Johnson fully healthy. We can talk about Johnson in a second, but what are your thoughts on Kyler Murray? So, pre-draft, I, for one, I, I did I did think he was going to the NFL the entire time. I did. Yeah. I, I thought. Yeah, like, I'm with was, you. Like, he was, like, going to the NFL. I thought that was his best chance. If he was allowed to, it like, that whole MLB thing. But, yeah. Um... You know, I liked him, but I didn't love him. Um, I used, I think he was my QB1, but he's partly my QB1 just because I wasn't really crazy about anybody else, really. Right. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like you said, like right now um, he's playing like a number one overall pick. First, you know, two, three weeks, it was kind of rough for him, but that's to be expected. Yeah. He's also, I mean, keep in mind, like, they have a rookie head coach as well. So it's, yeah. not, it's not just a rookie quarterback. you got a rookie head coach. That has never even coached the NFL. Yeah. It's not like he was an NFL offensive coordinator and was promoted. This guy went from Texas Tech to NFL. Like, yeah. You know, it's a big jump. So, And, I mean, he felt confident enough to throw away his rookie quarterback to get another rookie quarterback. Yeah. I mean, you better be, <laughs> you better be confident. That's the guy, right? So, I mean, right now it's really been working for him. And this is a bad time for the Buccaneers to catch this team. It yeah. is because they, they seem to be catching their stride. I know they went to New Orleans two weeks ago, got roughed up a good bit, but they played San Francisco pretty hard on Thursday night, came up short. And that was a good game as well. Yeah, that one yeah, came down yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah, Halloween night. Um, Andy Isabella, by the way, the uh, wide receiver for Arizona, he had that big yeah, touchdown. Yep. He's a UMass graduate. Shout out to UMass. There's an athlete over there named Isaiah Rogers. I played high school ball with him. Oh, He's a go. great talent. Um, just kind of wanted to make that connection because it was, I was cool. Wonder cause... what the connection was, was right? Like yeah, ass. yeah. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm go- I'm going somewhere with it, I swear. But it was pretty cool seeing him break that run because I'd heard his name throughout his time at UMass. So good for him. Shocked he but, wasn't uh, a patriot. It, Shocked. Yeah, really. Yeah, really. <laughs> but um, you hope he doesn't do it against the Bucks for sure. Yeah. Well. Yeah, he's a big part of their offense now too. But. Um, you know, like I said, they fought hard. They're at three, five, and one right now. They tied their the first game of the season, which what a buzzkill. Right? I feel like Arizona always ties somebody. Yeah, I think it was Seattle last year or something yeah. like that. And then, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Those, those NFC West seems to always tie somebody. Just that division alone, right? Always tie somebody. So, um, but I mean, you know, Arizona right now they're sitting at three, five, and one. And you gotta think if they go to three, six, and one, kind of done, right? Yeah. But if they go to four, five, and one, you're kind of feeling a whole lot better. So this is a big game for them as well. Yeah. Um, because the Buccaneers right now, the Cardinals have more to lose right now than the Buccaneers do. Because yeah. the Cardinals have one more win and they have the tie. So that's not a it's not a win, but it's not a loss. Exactly. So right now, the Cardinals, if they want to have any shot at anything, or even just to stay in the hunt, play December football, play meaningful December football, they got to have this game. Yeah. The offense, the Arizona Cardinals offense is going to come out trying to win the game. And and that's going to include a lot of different looks from C- Cliff Kingsbury and Kyler Murray. Um, and just like you said, Russell Wilson, at his age right now, every year he's run less and less and less. Yeah. Kyler Murray, like you said, is a rookie. Eventually he might run less, less, and less. But right now, those holes that Russell Wilson didn't take and elected to throw, Kyler Murray is likely to take that. Yeah. And I think Kyler Murray is probably faster than Russell Wilson. 
Um, Russell Wilson's a little bit more bulkier, but Murray is quicker and more yeah. agile uh, than Wilson. Um, and also, Murray can sling it a good bit. Like, oh, yeah. Like, he can, like, there's been, like, a few passes this year where I'm like, wow, like, that, like, impressed me. Um, I think he's only got a four or five interceptions on the year. Yeah. Last I looked at his stat sheet. But, yeah, he's a confident pass thrower, and that's the thing as well about the Arizona offense is that uh, Cliff Kingsbury in that offense, they're very pass heavy. It's all about the air attack with them. And mm-hmm. uh, you're going to look right at the Buccaneer secondary uh, and what kind of day they're going to have because yeah. um, I think the way that you went, oh, kind of kind of <laughs> said everything it needed to about this uh, this Bucks defensive backfield. Yeah, well, they're going up against you know Larry Fitzgerald, who isn't going to do the explosive plays really. But no, but you, he's a check you know, down yeah, guy. You know what he's going to be? You know he's going to move the chains. Oh yeah. Um, and then just like we mentioned, Annie Isabella, who's like their slot guy, kind of. They've been working him into that. Uh, and then Christian Kirk, who I believe is playing. Um, yeah. He's been really good for him this year. He was good last year as well. Um, they have some weapons, you know, uh, and. Biggest thing, I think, for the Bucks to help their secondary beat up on a Cardinals offensive line that is not very good. Yeah. And I understand that sacking Kyler Murray is going to be difficult just because he can get out, right? It's not like you're facing Tom Brady, Drew Brees, where right. if you get those guys in a pocket, the pocket's going to collapse and they're just going to go down. Mm-hmm. Kyler Murray's going to try to get out. That's how you got to help your secondary. you got to get pass rush. Kyler Murray gets out, scrambles, whatever. Have a spy on him. Hopefully you can contain him enough. The pass rush has got to show up. Yeah. They did a little bit in Seattle, but that fourth quarter wasn't much there at all. That fourth quarter in overtime drive, that was not much pass rush, and the secondary ended up paying for it. So, And that's ultimately when those sacks mean the most, because yeah. if you can nail one on a potential game-winning drive, yeah. uh, that's where it's going to show up the most. Uh, and people are going to pay the most attention. But you brought up this pass rush again. I think they're going to have a good day. Arizona's offensive line, again, as you mentioned, not very good. Um, So I think these guys can build off of what they put on the field last week and the week before, which was kind of showing that having Jason Pierre-Paul back on that line is helping a lot, uh, especially when you've got the pressure coming from the edge because Vita Vea, who is still a beast, you got all those guys coming at you, who are you going to block? But – A big day, a highlighted day for the linebackers. Um, I said this before the game last week on the uh, Bucks Report pregame show that we did live. I'll say it again this week. You're going to want to watch Devin White and Levante David because they're going to be making the majority of your tackles all day long. And I think, depending on where you're playing your secondary, obviously it just depends on the play, um, but they're going to be the ones responsible for breaking down these plays before they can get to that second level and really just break off for a big one. Like, we yeah. looked at the play last week. The only, the Chris biggest Carson. play on offense, Chris Carson. Yeah. Who chased him down and tackled him? Devin White. Devin White. And you look back at the film, Vernon Hargraves was taking his sweet-ass I, time. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if he was taking his time. I just don't know. I don't, I just, I don't I mean, know if he, he's fast enough. Like, I don't Devin know, Devin White dude. a linebacker faster than Vernon Hargraves? I, like, I don't have Hargraves' 40 time in front of me, but... I know Devin White's was pretty fast. They clocked him at 21.8 miles per hour chasing down Chris Carson. I mean, that is ridiculous. Yeah, it's. I saw like it. I said, is he the fastest player on the defense? Like, I asked that last week. and I, You know, I was confident in because I said no. I was confident that Levante is faster, but you kind of look at, uh, yeah, you know, the way he faster. chased it down. Yeah. Um, sideline to sideline, Levante's faster, but yeah. I think you get if those guys on a 40 ahead, time. Yeah. Devin yeah. White's got that speed, man. Yeah. Well, fast player on a defense, I think the fast player is actually not a starter. It's Ryan Smith. Yeah, Ryan Smith I'm with you is, there. is fast. Yeah, he gets down the field really, really well on special teams. That's where he showcases Let's that. Let's just do that instead on Sunday. Just have all the players line up, just run. Well, I saw something as I saw something uh, as well on Twitter. I don't remember who sent it out. You probably saw it too. Um, I want to say it was Trevor Sikama, but he's like, let's just throw Devin White at running back for a few plays. Like let's just might you know, work. Let's just go ham. You know what I mean? Send him up the gut. He'll he'll do what Peyton Barber can't because apparently he's got more boost than uh, Peyton Barber does. But what I'm trying to say, it's going to be a big day for the linebackers. So you're going to want to pay attention to them because um, those are going to be the guys that help out the secondary. Everyone in front of the secondary, the six or seven players in front of the backfield, are going to be the ones who ultimately make it easier for. The young yep. defensive backfield, but let I mean, let's not like kid ourselves. The secondary is supposed to play good, right? yeah. Like I mean, it goes hand in hand, right? 
The players in front of the secondary have to play well. Yeah. The players themselves in the secondary have to play well, right? Carlton Davis is out for this game. Okay, Bruce Arians said it today. Uh, Thank three, you. I was just googling yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the three, the three are Carlton Davis, Carl Nassib, and Anthony Nelson. All three so, of those are out. Yeah, that's why this earlier this week they signed Sam Acho. Yep. And uh, promoted Kazine Daniels to the uh, uh, roster. Who you know, if you guys don't know, uh, Daniels, his story is kind of special because. He's blind in one eye, actually. Uh, he signed with the Bucks as an undrafted free agent and spent time on their practice squad. Um, so he might get some snaps. I'm not sure how many because, I mean, you got to guess Jason Pierre-Paul is going to play yeah. most of the snaps. Well, he played a ridiculous – kind of a side note, JPP played a ridiculous amount of snaps in the Seattle game. Well, that's what he wants. Yeah. Like, he doesn't come out. Like, if you look at, like, his career – even in New York, like he didn't really come out a whole lot, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think after the game or whatever, somebody told him a snap count. He's like, "Yeah, like th- that's more yeah, like it." That's right? awesome. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, Shaq Barrett's gonna get the majority of snaps too. So, not sure how much of Daniels you'll see, but a little interesting um, side note there. But yeah, so the secondary, it's gonna be probably Vernon Hargraves, Jamel D on the outside with Sean Murphy Bunting in nickel, and then Ryan Smith, I would assume, would be filling in if. One of those guys would happen to come off, and, um, and you have to assume. I mean, you're running the same personnel in the secondary yeah. as you did last week, and last week they ran nickel for most of the game. Yeah. Are they going to do that again this week? I think it all depends on the looks. I would assume so because the Cardinals aren't really a power running team, so right. it's going to be a lot of three wide receiver, four wide receiver sets, and you want to have the the best personnel you can out there for that. And the best personnel for that is nickel or dime packages. So I uh, would assume that you're going to see a lot of nickel. Yeah. Um, Jamel Dean, a guy that was brought up briefly. Um, you want to see how he can capitalize off of last yeah. week because as up and down as his game was, the common theme was when he made plays well, like he made them really well. Yeah. You know, but when he made some boneheaded mistakes, he just made the mistakes and there isn't much you can do about that other than fix it. But it's going to be interesting to see how he can bounce back this week and see if he can take any steps uh, playing corner, outside corner. I mean, I think it's an easier matchup right now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're either going up against <laughs> Tyler Lockett or DK Metcalf. And right. DK Metcalf, yeah, he's a rookie, but his physical tools are unreal. Um, you know, and it seemed like in that game, it just. I'm going to bring it up again. It seemed like in the fourth quarter, the entire defense just got tired. Like, oh, yeah. On that DK Metcalf touchdown. Especially just, Dean. Jamel Dean was just gassed. Like, I mean, I don't know what it was. And, I mean, still, it's going to be 70 degrees or whatever in Tampa. It's going to be probably a little humid. Like, Nice. You're, you're going to have to find a way to keep the same energy in the fourth quarter as you did in the first and second. Right. right. Um, so I think that's actually a big thing. And it, it's a generic thing to say. But, oh, they need to play with more energy. But it's true, I think. So yeah. Jamal Dean, I think he's going to have a better day. Like you said, he made plays. Fortunately, he didn't make enough of them. And especially the timeliness of the plays. Yeah. Um, over time, got picked on a little bit. But, you know, late in the game, just, I mean, they were throwing his way every time. And, yeah. don't, you know, the Cardinals have that take. The Cardinals had the Bucks versus Seahawks tape, and they saw exactly what Jamel Dean was doing. Yeah. So you think Cliff Kingsbury is just going to say, hey, Larry, go over there and just run. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm not sure where they're going to line up Larry Fitzgerald. Sometimes he plays a slot. Sometimes he plays outside. But when he is playing outside, like, it's going to be out of Jamel Dean or Vernon Hargrave. So yeah. um, Larry Fitzgerald is not a guy who's going to burn you with his speed. But like we said, he's always going to keep the chains moving. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, big day for the secondary, and hopefully um, they can limit it enough because I think as long as the secondary gives the pass rush enough time, like I said, I think it goes hand in hand, right? Good pass rush helps out a bad secondary, but a bad secondary can also be can also help out your pass rush a little bit. Yeah. Maybe take away that quick slant right there. Kyler Murray has to hold onto the ball for an extra second or two. The pass rush gets gets home. Exactly, because there's. There's a few of those times where you see the pass rush really hit home and things just look great. Like Vita yeah. Vea, uh, last week, he had one or two plays where, I mean, he broke, shot his gap perfectly. Yeah. There really wasn't much the lineman can do. So you want to hope that those situations come up because, uh, yeah, it's all about getting to the quarterback there. Now, 
there's one more thing I want to go over about this defense, and then we'll go into our weekly checklist and break things down. Um, there was this graph that was seen, and I think it was the uh, it was like a team's blitz percentage. Okay. Versus, uh, it was like the X axis was their blitz percentage, and the Y axis was like their blitz hitting home percentage. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I, yep. And the way that the uh, the way that the graph was set up was. You had all 32 teams generally around the middle of the circle, and then way up in the top right was the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think I, I think I've seen it. I, I think I've seen it. I want to say that it was. Um, I want to say that that was the uh, was the purpose of the graph, but I do know that it came down to blitzes. And one thing it says about this Bucks defense is that they are going to blitz the hell out of you. And I mean, I, I think they're just. I think we'll see a lot of blitzes on Sunday, but. Do they get home with a lot of them? Right. The answer right now is no. Yeah. Right? Like, that's that's the biggest thing. And would like them to tone down the blitzes a little bit. Because <laughs> I, I, I do think – I'm a fan of blitzing. Like, I'm a fan of aggressive style defense. But this is too much. I think it, it, gotta... well, it's too much when you have an inexperienced secondary like that. Yeah. You can't afford to leave your guys like that on an island because, unfortunately, cases like last week will happen time and time again. Yeah. If you just keep blitzing one on one matchup, a guy like Larry Fitzgerald's going to take advantage of that. You know, he's been around the block five different times. Well, even know? then, you got uh, Larry Fitzgerald and the weapons that are there on the offense for Kyler Murray, but you've also got Kyler Murray. So, where, okay, yeah, it, you yeah, know, yeah. you send a linebacker and the he entire gets, right side of the field is yeah. exposed, he's going to have a field day. So, yeah, yeah maybe you want to limit the blitzes, but uh, you want to time them to where you can hit home. And right now, uh, the Buccaneers are just shooting from the hip most of the yeah, time when it comes to blitzing going on defense. But we'll see if they can clean it up and do a little bit better of a job and hopefully get the pressure on Kyler Murray because that's very, very important. Every week on the show, we do something called the Weekly Checklist where I give you three things the Bucks need to do if they want to win this game. Um, last week, I do not remember the Weekly Checklist because the overtime loss kind of took blur. it. Yeah, the overtime <laughs> loss really just blurred everything pregame that we did. But we got some good ones for you this week. And Evan, if you want to throw any in at any point, just punch me on the shoulder and I'll stop talking. So, taking a look at the weekly checklist. First thing that I have got is for the Buccaneers to target O.J. Howard. We brought up O.J. Howard. Now he's coming back this week. You want to bring him back in a capacity where he can do more than he's been able to do thus far this season. Because he's been a blocker, but I think having that healthy offensive line really opens things up for him to find a mismatch against the Arizona Cardinals defense. And I think you can throw to him a little more as a wide receiver. I think throwing to him as the pass-catching tight end that we know and love will make us eventually forget about the lack of wide receiver three that this team faces. But if you want to move the ball on offense and really come out with that balanced attack... Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, and Ronald Jones, they're not going to be able to do it all by themselves. So get O.J. Howard involved and uh, give him some catches because I think he can do it. Yeah, if you're talking about weapons-wise, your your core four pieces should be Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Ronald Jones, O.J. Howard. Yep. Like, no matter what, right? Talking just about weapons. Offense, obviously you need you know the tackle, franchise tackle, franchise quarterback, whatever. But if you're talking about pure weapons – you know, right now, what would you say? I think probably just two, right? Chris Godwin and Mike Evans are your cornerstone weapons. Right. Ronald Jones has been nice, but but he's not a weapon yet. Yeah, and he, he's you not. Don't, you don't know if he can do this consistently, right? Right. He yeah. hasn't had really a hundred yard rushing game yet. He hasn't had now. He has had a few nice runs negated by penalties, but he hasn't had that one sixty five yard yeah. touchdown. He's on his he's on his Ben Simmons year right now. He's technically still a rookie. <laughs> So we'll see if he can improve. But, yeah, I mean, he's definitely not a guarantee. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That really bummed you out? <laughs> We're going there. Oh, We're I didn't going mean there. I didn't mean to take it hey, that far. Well, he won Rookie of the Year anyway. So he did. He did win Rookie Ronald of the Year. Ronald Jones is going to win Offensive Rookie of the Year. Is that what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> if he can blow our minds these past eight games, then maybe he can. But uh, <laughs> he's got a lot of running to do to catch up to Christian McCaffrey. Well, who's not a well, rookie, but, nah, you know. <laughs> It'll probably be Kyler Murray. <laughs> yeah. So, speaking of Kyler Murray, he is the second point on our checklist. Sounds obvious. Put a spy on Kyler Murray. Yep. You're going to want to depend on those linebackers more than ever to keep their eyes on him at all times. Because as we talked about, 
You look at the game plan going up against Russell Wilson, you kind of had the same mindset of you're going to want to keep an eye on this guy, but what separates those two is age, and that's going to lead to Kyler Murray, uh, Kyler Murray ultimately taking more carries, and he'll split out and run when you're not expecting it. So you're going to want to make sure you keep him under tight wraps because uh, the Buccaneers' run defense is good, but I don't think any of those big linemen are going to catch up to Kyler Murray if he bounces outside of the v- pocket. Vita Vey is not catching up. Yeah. He's not, you know, chasing down Kyler Murray. 21.8 uh, miles per hour, huh? Yeah, well... <laughs> I mean, hey, so we talked about Devin White's speed, right? He'd be the most logical fit to spy him. Right. But, well, this might be a concern that you actually have, because I really don't. Okay. Who's the more short tackler, Levante David or Devin White? Levante David, for sure. I I will say Levante David as well. But, you know, I think it's a give or take thing, right? I think Devin White is faster than Levante David, but I think if you want... To him to be tackled right away, your best bet is Levante David. Well, I mean, I feel a little bit better with Devin White covering Kyler Murray because, you know, no disrespect to the guy, but it's a little bit easier for Devin White to tackle a quarterback who's five foot eleven as opposed to I thought he was you know, shorter than that. I think he's yeah, I think he's five ten, five nine or five ten. So when it comes to Devin White covering a guy like Kyler Murray with his stature, again, no disrespect, but I imagine that Devin White is gonna have his number. Um <laughs> like he'll like he'll know how to tackle that guy, you know. It kind of goes back to the point of how running backs who are a little bit shorter can be a Kyler, little more slippery. Kyler Murray's five ten. Five ten. Yeah. Okay. But I have to assume that Devin White's going to do an okay job. But either way, you're going to have some pretty uh, pretty competent linebackers. Um, Devin White covering is him. two inches taller. Than him. Okay. He, well, Devin White's six foot. That's all. Well, he's what, like fifty pounds heavier too. Yeah, I think. Devin White on, on Wikipedia <laughs> it says two thirty eight. I don't know what Kyler's is, but nah, yeah. definitely not two thirty eight. No, but he'd be looking pretty chubby if it was two thirty eight. Yeah, really. <laughs> but I think those guys can have a good day. Uh, they're going to be really be looking out for Kyler Murray and Devin White. If he can build off of the game he had last week, uh, twelve tackles, two forced fumbles, of course, and then half a sack. Uh, I think he'll show up and he'll do a good job of containing him. I'm confident. I mean, have to, right? If, if, if he starts getting on a roll, that opens up a whole other element to the Cardinals' offense. Yeah. And something that you didn't – I mean, you're going to game plan for, but on any given play, you're not going to be able to to stop, right? Because if you're going to be covering your guys on a particular play, you're not really going to be worried about him. But right. if he just gets out there, what do you get? He'll do, have right? room. Exactly. So something to look out for, but it'll be an interesting matchup as well. Last thing on the weekly checklist, keep the offensive game plan balanced, but not conservative. We've seen way too many times that conservative play calling loses this Bucks team football games, and um, I think it's going to come down to just keeping things balanced, but not getting too conservative. I mean, yeah. exactly what I just yeah. said. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've seen this team get conservative before, but if you can find that balance to where you can get Arizona to bite on a play action, yep. uh, you can stretch the field a little bit, or you can get Rojo really on a roll, um, you still want to keep it balanced and not get crazy. Because if Rojo's running great, I don't want to see first, second, and third down handoffs to Rojo. I just don't. I just Nobody or, wants to see know, that. Like fourth and one, the game's on the line. Fourth and one, game's on the line. A lot of people want to bring up that's you know, the fumble thing in Tennessee, but... Um, yeah. No, I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. And I, I think Peyton Barber for that play was not the move. Um, I don't think running with the ball with anybody was the move. Yeah. But whatever. You're right? not wrong. That's but two weeks ago, whatever. Hindsight's always twenty twenty. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> you know, we're just going to sit back and just look at... Just a few things, right? Matt Gay makes the field goal. Bucks convert that fourth and one. Right, yeah. You know, bunch of different things. So, But, I mean, the game plan, if they are able to run the ball and pass the ball well, say they got a good chance to win. Absolutely. Would, you know, if, Absolutely. They, if they don't win, that'd be something. Because So, let's get some game predictions out there. Oh, boy. And then we'll wrap things up and get out of here. I'll give mine first. Okay. And, I mean... <laughs> You call me the eternal optimist. Oh, no. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, he always gets he always gets so offended when I get like positive about the team on the show. Well, I... No, go ahead. You are one of the well, you're not the okay. Come I will, on, I'm I will not admit, that bad. I will bad. admit that you there actually is I've run into a lot more people that are a lot more optimistic than you are. Right? I know, I know. But, I'm not saying we're gonna run the table and well, go to the you playoffs. You also said this team was gonna go seven and nine. 
which I still know. believe they have room to go seven and nine. What if they lose this week? <laughs> then they're probably not going to go seven and nine. But is as it, of does right it go now, down to six and ten. Does does it, it, like, go yeah, down, it'll like go one. down. It'll go down to six and ten. <laughs> no, I, I think this is the time where I, I think the team is finally bought into the BA mentality. I think they know what's going on. I think they did before Seattle. And the reason Seattle sucks as a loss is because that team played competent football, they took it good. down to the against wire. A good team they well. played good football against a good team, exactly. They took it down to the wire, couldn't get it done because their offense didn't even get to take the field, uh, and their defense was tired as hell. I'm not saying they should be a six-win football team, but I'm saying I think they finally come around to what B.A. and his staff are trying to do. I also feel more confident that B.A. is going to be here next year. I, I just, I, I yeah. just do. I think everyone kind of has this growing Safe sense bet. that, yeah, See, yeah, I, that I, he'll I, stick around. I'd I bet a good amount of money that he's going to be here no matter what. But I think they're going to play good football, and I think they're going to beat Arizona. I think What's they the win. Score? What's the score? Yeah, uh, we'll go high scoring again. I will say 35 31 thirty-one. It'll okay. be a game-winning touchdown. Game-winning touchdown. Sure. How why many? Not? How many seconds left? How or many it, seconds or you talk, left? Or are, you, or are you talking like let's talk, a minute and then like the defense well, stops? Well, let's, let's say like four-minute drill, right? Okay. You got about four minutes on the clock, kind of like San Francisco, except okay. Jameis won't throw uh. an interception on the first <laughs> play of the drive. Um, so I will say, yeah, they'll have the four-minute drill, go down the field, score, and then the defense will hold off Kyler Murray, hopefully, and the Bucks sneak out with a victory 35-31 to to finally end that four-game losing streak. But that's my prediction. What is yours? You know what this means, right? What? It's gonna end like sixteen to ten. No, stop it! Stop. Dude, just because? No, yeah, because we just, say it's yeah, high scoring. Be, I mean, doesn't it seem that way? No, it's funny like, because like we've any had... game that seems like oh, there's gonna be a shootout. We're like, no, it's not. Like, <laughs> well, we've had the opposite happen. I've had more than a few games that we say on the show like, oh, I feel like this is gonna be a high scoring contest. I didn't think they're gonna or, put um, thirty four Seattle. Like I, I didn't either. <laughs> I thought that game was gonna be twenty one twenty four Seattle, and they put up twice that. Yeah. Um. It, but it's been, yeah, it's been kind of ironic because I've had a few games this season where I'm like, yeah, it's going to be a low scoring affair, and then the, both teams put up 26 plus points. So yeah. uh, we'll see what happens. But I got to know your prediction. I feel like you're dodging me. Okay. Well, I'm not really dodging. You know, are you just, dodging? Just waiting for the right. Are you dodging all the angry Instagram people that are gonna? Oh my god. Hear this prediction. Oh well, right? That's, oh, that's what I say. <laughs> like, come on. Like, it's a prediction. You know, you actually, people that get mad at me for predicting losses should actually be happy when I predict a loss because the two that I predicted losses, they won. So yeah, I mean, come on, like I got you. Like, I got you. You know, I you know I picked them to win against the 49ers. They didn't. I picked them to win against the Giants. They should have, but they didn't. Um, I'm gonna go with my gut here. Okay. I'll do a score. It might not be as high as that one. Uh, Cardinals 27. Bucks 31. All right. I, I think I think they end up squeaking out a win. They're desperate. They're due for one. Four straight losses. <laughs> yeah. It'd be um, nice to finally talk about a W here on the show again. Yeah. The home game. They're back at home now. This Cardinals team isn't the best. They get O.J. Howard back. The offense played well last week. Just like you said, they're finally they're playing a better brand of football now than they were early in the year. Yeah. Uh, like that Rams game. It was a win, but it wasn't pretty. Yeah. Like, I mean, it was high scoring. Yeah. It was franchise record, yeah, 55 was, points. But it, it was the there was a lot wrong. Was, uh, like, you know, um, Carolina, first Carolina game, just low scoring. Offense couldn't get nothing going. So now they're finally starting to put together, like, complete football games. And I just think they're able to do just enough. Um, maybe not a game-winning touchdown, but maybe have like the lead with like six minutes left, and then just just don't just don't surrender. Yeah. Or maybe they have like a bigger lead. Maybe it's like thirty-one twenty with six minutes left, <laughs> and then they give away and, the and, touchdown and, and, with like and, three minutes and, yeah, left. Yeah, and the Cardinals score, you know, just to make it <laughs> in yeah. classic Bucks fashion. They give up the score late, but hopefully it's not enough to lose them the game. But one th- thing for the checklist, that okay, and it's only because I'm here. I got you. Make all the kicks. Because <laughs> because last year, like I said, I went to that Washington game, and that was Chandler Catanzaro's last game with the Bucks because he missed, I believe, an extra point and two field goals during that game. Yes, he did. So just make the kicks. Yeah. Just, I'm, I'm here. Just 
I don't want to see any missed kicks. Well, Matt Gay's been on a tear, and I mean, uh, he was perfect ever since the death threats. Um, well, yeah. And in Seattle, missed, a missed the 50 yarder before halftime, which would have been really nice to have, yeah. but it's a 50 yarder in Seattle. I'm but not going to be super pissed about it. At least you're not bringing up the Matt Bryant thing again, like you did on Monday. Oh, no. I said that once. That I was, don't need to say it again. No, because, like I said, we got to see no. how this week goes. Oh, my God. <laughs> Is no. that why you're even more nervous about if they can make their kicks or not? Actually, yes. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I didn't mean you to do that to that? you. Just puts it like in, I think in a lot of people's heads. Just like no, but the curse over, it. and then naturally, you know, you're 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 gonna get the answer, and you're like, oh nope. <laughs> you don't you have said a point. It. I have a oh, point. Oh, I know you do. I know you do. You said it, not me. I didn't mention it at all this oh, week. Oh my god, go back. All right, no, it's, no, no, it's no, no, no. The no. end of the episode, actually. Go back, and you'll you'll for one, you might hear me threaten Brent with a pouring a <laughs> cup of soda on his head if <laughs> Mackay misses a kick. Um, but first off, you'll hear him say, who you'll hear him actually whisper into the mic, that uh, a certain curse might be over. I'm not going to yeah. say which curse. I don't know. You don't have to go check that out, but if you really want to, then go over our last week's game preview episode. But ladies and gentlemen, that's just about going to do it for this episode of the Cannon Fire Podcast. Thank you so much for watching with video on YouTube and BoxReport.com or listening anywhere you listen to our podcast. This has been episode 80 we're that much closer to, to 100. Yeah, to 80 episodes of this show. So really hope we can keep putting out some great content for you guys and talk about a Buccaneers win, hopefully, this time next week. Hopefully. Now, you can follow the show on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Cannon Fire Podcast. If you search it, you can find it. There is your number one source to find all sorts of updates <laughs> when it comes to the show. So make sure you follow us over there. You can follow me on social media at Redicus on Instagram and Twitter. If you follow me, I'll follow you back. And, of course, you can follow my co-host Evan Wanish on Instagram and Twitter at Bucks Wave. Uh, I don't know if he'll follow you back. He didn't follow me back until, like, a few months ago. That was just on Twitter, though. Yeah, yeah I mean, that was just on like Twitter. Like I said, I mean, I'm going to explain this every, every time you mention that. You rarely use Twitter until about maybe <laughs> three months ago. Oh, yeah. No, so, you're not wrong. Like, I sort of get a pass on that one, kind of. <laughs> because, like, I don't know. I feel like... That's almost like with Instagram, too. Like, on my personal Instagram, like, if I'm following an account that hasn't posted since 2015, I'm going to unfollow it. Right. Like, no, I get not... it. I get it. Hey, I'm having a lot of fun with Twitter, so if you guys want to uh, see what all that's about, follow me over there. Now, as always, CFP is brought to you by Pinecrest Printing and Signs. Do you need an image for your business? Well, they've got you covered in more ways than one. They've been providing the Tampa Bay business community with quality commercial printing and design since 2001. Their printing professionals are ready to provide you with quality marketing solutions for today's industry. They're also the newest sponsor of the Cannon Fire podcast. These guys do everything. Wide format, banners, decals, apparel. Actually, the apparel that you're looking at on the screen right now, some official merchandise of the Cannon Fire podcast, We've got shirts for sale at $20 and stickers for $3 included free with a purchase of a shirt. So check that out. All sorts of good info. Thank you to Pinecrest Printing and Signs. You can give them a call at 813-684-5444 or check out the website at pinecrestprinting.com. I am Rhett, signing off for Evan, and we will catch you guys next time. Go Bucks!